Hello everyone, this is Eva Norlik smith with Yoga You Online, and I am very pleased to welcome you to tonight's talk with Judy Hansen Lasseter on Restore and Rebalance, the Power of Restorative Yoga. As the pace of modern life picks up, it seems like the need really is greater than ever to find ways to incorporate moments of silence and peace into our lives. And this is where restorative yoga comes in. Restorative yoga is more than a way to relax. As Judith puts it so well in her writings, the deep peace and calm that restorative poses can induce is a way of deepening body awareness and get us in touch with deeper layers of our being. And Judith, of course, is eminently qualified to talk about this topic. She is the author of eight books on yoga, including Relax and Renew, Restful Yoga for Stressful Times. Judith, a very, very warm welcome to you. It is lovely to talk to you. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to people about one of my favorite topics, which is doing nothing. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you want to start with some questions, or how would you like to start? Maybe I should start with uh, my definition of restorative yoga. Yes, that would be wonderful. First of all, I think it's somewhat strange that we have to have something called restorative yoga. I mean, what is the other yoga, destructive yoga? What? <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad joke, Eva. Um, but what restorative yoga is to me is the use of props to support the body in positions of comfort and ease to facilitate relaxation and health. And one of the biggest misunderstandings about restorative yoga is a lack of clarity, I think, on the difference between stretching and opening. So when we do a physical yoga, an asana, generally our intention is to stretch the body and or to strengthen the body. But restorative yoga does not have as its goal stretching. In fact, that's part of the reason that we use the props, because we want to create opening, which is a deeper thing than stretching. And you may have experienced this, and some of our listeners have probably, I know I have, that when I stretch really deeply and I'm at the edges of my stretch, there's often paradoxically a pulling back from that edge, an emotional pulling back or a psychic pulling back or even a physical pulling back because there can be harm when you, when you go over the edge. You go too far in stretching, which we've all probably done. So restorative yoga is to stay away from that edge, and it helps you give up the fear of letting go because there's still some space left in there. So we encourage opening more than stretching. That's beautiful. Thank you. We have a person who wrote in with a beautiful experience of restorative yoga that I think also highlights some of the deeper dimensions of the practice. Um, do you want to hear that uh, comment slash questions? I'd love that. Okay, so it's from Lisa, and she says, In 2003, I took your restorative yoga tra teacher training, and I remember you talking about shunyata as a state that can be experienced practicing restorative yoga. I have often found that going deep into relaxation, I experience a state of quote-unquote gone, where I come back from a nothingness that doesn't feel the same as sleep, but there was absolutely no awareness, no observer during that time. When guiding people into deep relaxation through hypnotic and meditative techniques, many times they report the same experience. I was gone, but I know I wasn't sleeping. Is that what you were referring to as shunyata or emptiness? 
a restorative rest so deep that we merge with the source, a kind of suspended animation. And it is it is profoundly healing in any number for any number of challenges, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Would appreciate your thoughts. Well, I I think what she's referring to is the way I speak specifically of shavasana, and not all restorative poses are shavasana. Mm. Shavasana is a pose in which the head and a resting pose in which the head and heart are on the same level. So some restorative pose, poses like supported Supta Baddha Konasana, your head is higher than your heart. But in Shavasana, your head and heart are on the same level. And then there are poses like supported bridge pose in which your head is lower than your heart. And that's the way the new book, uh, Restore and Rebalance, that's the way it's organized. Poses head above the heart, head and heart on the same level, head below the heart. And what happens in Shavasana I think there are three stages of it. And I make a distinction between Shavasana and relaxation. So it takes the average person 15 minutes to really relax. And so I think that once you are relaxed, physiologically, measurably, heart rate slows down, breathing slows down, blood pressure drops, and a lot of other physiologic markers uh, change that when we when we relax deeply then shavasana begins so if we lay our students down on the floor for 10 minutes and say that's it get up that's not enough time they need they need 10 12 15 minutes depending on their practice and their state the level of their practice and their state at the moment but i like to say 15 minutes and then we go into Shavasana. And Shavasana is that state which I can describe from my point of view as I suddenly lose the awareness of the distinctiveness of my arms and legs and head and trunk. I just feel this warm heaviness on the floor, indistinguished. And I feel that I'm way back inside of me. And the sense that there's a huge space around me, like the roof is really high and the walls are really wide and there's a lot of space. And I lose ambition. I have no urge to produce, perform, act, serve, create. I have the same intense experience of curiosity. I lose in those moments, my curiosity for what is outside of me. If I hear a noise in the background, it does not draw my attention. I hear it, but I'm not so curious about it. And that's a stage, the second stage, I, it's, I guess the best word we know is pratyahara, which is the conscious moving back, letting go of, the conscious letting go of the input of the senses. It doesn't mean you don't feel the hardness of the floor or hear the sound or feel the cold air perhaps just weighing on your skin, the cool air of the room, but you are not drawn out into that experience. And that's what I'm calling Shavasana. And I want, when I tell my teachers in my trainings, I want you to leave your students 20 minutes so they can have 15 or so minutes to get physiologically unwound and then rest in that pratyahara slash shavasana state. So the minimum to me is 20 minutes. Now what the question was talking about is this, the third level, which is a state I call a shunya. A-S-H, and in this case the S-H is one letter in Sanskrit, but in English it's two, a shunya. And it means non-emptiness. So it isn't a state of, technically, the, the concept of a shunya is not fullness and it's not emptiness. It's somewhere in between. And the only way you know you were in a shunya is you come back from it. It is only known by its absence. Right now, we're not in it because our focus is too external. But when we go, and that doesn't happen to me every day when I practice my Shavasana. It happens sometimes. And I can always get to the Shavasana state, but not always 
the Ashinya state. But when I come back and I realize that I have been somewhere and it wasn't sleep. And I think it's that there is only in the Ashinya state the smallest focus of ego. That there is, as she was saying, our, our questioner, there is a deeper merging with the collective unconscious or the unconscious or another. It, 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 the words are so ill-equipped to convey the experience, but it's sort of like women have asked me, I have three children, as you know, and they say, well, what does labor actually feel like? How will I know? And every woman who's ever been pregnant looks at this pregnant woman and says, you'll know. <laughs> it's, it's like, how will I know I'm tasting a peach? You'll know. When you taste it, you'll know it's a peach. And so we can't really explain that state. I don't think it's a, a level of sleep because it is so different. And I know in my sleep, I I have been aware that I was sleeping and, and aware that I was dreaming. And here's a technique that you can try. It's when you're going to sleep, pick pick something to focus on. I always focus on a red rose. It needs to be something concrete, not like it can't be love or happiness. It's too abstract. But a symbol that means something to you. And to me, it's this beautiful red rose. And sometimes I I really want to be in touch with my unconscious mind about what's going on with me. So I when I go to sleep, now remember, sleep is a distinct physiological state from rest. They can be measured. They can be studied. They can be identified as separate. They're related. They're first cousins. But you can rest, you can sleep and wake up and not feel rested. And you can go into a deeply restful state and, and then maybe need a little less sleep that night. So they're connected, but they're not the same. So you take, you're lying down, you're about to go to sleep, and you hold in your focus of your consciousness this symbol. For me, it's the red rose. And when I was taught this practice, they said in probably take two to three weeks, you will begin to be dreaming and the red rose will appear. And then you'll know that your con- your consciousness is present with the messages being sent through the dream from the unconscious mind. Okay, it happened for me on three, three days. And there was my rose. And then I thought, and then I was a part of me that was watching saying, okay, now I'm having a conscious dream. This is a dream and I'm having this dream. And I'm listening to my unconscious. But I think that what a shunya is, there's no I there. There's no I. There's no ego to organize experience. You're underneath that. You're, you're, you're deeper than that. There is no narrowing of experience through the the funnel of ego. You know, there was a book that came out in the last few years about a neurosurgeon. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Maybe someone will help me. One of our listeners will help me. And something about heaven. And he was not a religious person, although he went to church as part of a social thing that he did. He lived in a part of the country where church was important and and he, he went and enjoyed it and the camaraderie and the companionship. But then he had this experience. He got a very uh, extreme and rare virus. And when he was in the, they thought he was going to die because almost no one had ever heard of it or how to treat it or what to do with it. And he had this experience of going to the other side. And the interesting thing, they, they thought he was going to die because his brain was pretty much flat on all the technological machines. And then he just woke up and he had memories of what had happened while he was away. But the doctors, he was a a neurosurgeon himself. And he and none of his, his friends and scientists and doctors could understand how he could have memory with no brain activity. 
And he, the weirdest thing of all was he met someone on the other side who he, had, he felt very comfortable with but didn't know. And then he ended up going to a relative's house and seeing a picture of this person who he had never seen before and he knew who it was and no one had ever told him who that person was. I mean, the whole thing is very strange. Uh, but my point is that we have really so much more to learn about the brain and consciousness. And so for now, I'm very happy with this idea of relaxation, prachahara, and factor X, state X, which I call ischemia. But it definitely is there. I've experienced it, and I had a lot of reports from other people that they have this, this state that you can't, if you're in a shunya, you can't say, oh, I'm in a shunya, like conscious dreaming. Because if you can say, I'm in a shunya, you are by definition not there. Beautiful. We, we've got uh, someone sending a note about the book. If you want to uh, tell people the title, it's Eben Alexander, The Proof of Heaven. The Proof of Heaven, yeah. Eben, E-B-E-N, Alexander, I think. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> it was a fascinating book. I don't know what I think about it, but I liked being slightly disturbed by it. That was a comfort to me, actually, paradoxically. <laughs> because I think we... I like science. I teach science, anatomy and kinesiology. I'm a physical therapist. I like studies and statistics and science. And at the same time, I'm a bit of a mystic, a Piscean mystic. And I don't think we can understand everything with our brain. And and this is a interesting thing, Eva, that I've been – uh, holding as a precious idea that our practice of meditation and restorative yoga, I believe, is meditative. But meditation is often taught from the brain, watching the thoughts. Consciousness, consciousness lives in the brain, and I believe it's possible to become too heady with our, with our meditation. And so I've invented this word called, you know, we have mindfulness, but it's bodyfulness. Mm. And it's awareness lives in the belly and consciousness lives in the brain. Mm. And I know that when I, one, this is one of the reasons I think restorative yoga is such a powerful tool is because it isn't brain-centered. We tell the brain, all right, this is not about you right now. This is about my body. This is about my breath. I mean, who told us that somehow the body was lesser than and was not the direct manifestation of divinity? So they've studied, here as we talk about science again, but science, of course, is talking about 80% of our well -being, sense of well-being comes from our gut and how intelligent our gut is. And all the messages that are not just going from the brain to the gut, to the belly, but are going from the belly to the brain, just a super highway of informing the brain about all the stuff that's going on. And we don't pay attention to it generally until it breaks through into pain. But this is one reason I think our heady, heady Western world takes to restorative yoga because it is so body centered and the brain is just you go sit over there you go do your thing over there I'm not going to pay much attention to you right now I'm going to stay with the sensations of my body and if right now we all do that we just go into the belly Yeah, that's beautiful. You can feel your, can you feel your heartbeat? Sometimes. I can feel my heartbeat. And I feel in my belly right now this warm sense of well-being. 
And it's just an idea that I have about awareness living in the belly. Because we have nerves in the chest cavity and in the abdomen that respond to the same neurotransmitters as, as the nerves that make up the brain. And there's a deep intelligence in our physicality. And when we stay in the belly, we're not, we're not angry. And we're radically present. And this is one of the gifts of restorative practice is it literally takes us out of our brain. So much dominance from our thought and more into our sensation because sensation is the thought or the sensations are the thoughts of the abdomen and they're more directly in touch with our unconscious and with life itself your brain is really fast but your gut is never wrong thank you for that question yeah, that was a beautiful answer. I loved what you said. The sensations are the thoughts of the abdomen. Yeah, the belly. Yeah. The belly, yeah. That's beautiful. And when I stay there, Eva, I like what comes out of my mouth. Mm, yeah. I mean, in yoga classes, we hear a lot. It's a lot about talking and deciding from the top down about movement. So the brain is very present there, and we can study philosophy and Sanskrit anatomy and all the brain things, which I love. But there's a little bit of the heart. But it's often just taught open the front heart. And I think we could sit right now, if this is safe for you to do and you're not listening in your car or something, you close your eyes and just sit with a nice open long spine, nice arch in the base, and open the back of your heart. Now open the sides of your heart. Now open the skylight of your heart. And most importantly, open the floor of your heart and flood yourself with blessings. But then we can, so I think we need that element in our lives and our practice and our relationships. And we, but we also need to go down one more level to the belly. And feel now. And you can feel your heart. You can feel life pulsing in you. Because there are these knots we create emotionally in our lives. And these traumas that we have created these knots in our emotional body. And the practice of restorative is especially good at dissolving those knots. So that this heart opening can just give you wings, give you a moment of fearlessness, give you, because I think love and courage both live in the heart. And when you open the heart, you feel that waves of love and gratitude and you become a lion, your own lion self. Mm. So to me, lying down, on the floor in Javasana with all your wonderful props for 20 minutes is an act of extreme courage because you are vulnerable, your eyes are covered, you're open, you're not defended. And it is the courage to be deeply intimate with yourself. And we have so many ways of running away from that. <laughs> We don't need it. And I'm not even going to say the ways because you know all the list of the ways. Um, we escape into our brain. So what I've been doing, you know me, I'm always into some, um, uh, my practice is never the same. I mean, my practice is, I hope, I, I, I pray that my practice is growing over the years and deepening. Where I am right now with it is I get on my mat and I say a namaste to my teacher and all my teachers, teachers, and I say a silent namaste to everyone in the world who's on their yoga mat with me, my invisible sangha at the moment. And I practice until I feel grateful. And 
I do about half my practice is supported. You know, shoulder stand on the chair, supported back bends, Vibrita Karani, supported Halasana, a lot of inversions supported. This is these are in the new book, by the way. And I, I practice until I feel grateful. The spontaneous arising of gratitude. And and I don't even link it specifically to something. I wait upon the appearance of gratitude. And when gratitude finds me, that's enough yoga for today. And then I leave my mat. I say my namastes to everyone who's on the mat with me and to my teacher and my teachers, 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 back into infinity. And then I start my day in a position of gratitude, which wipes out impatience, arrogance, fear, and it lasts, that glow lasts for a while. But now, because that was the imprint, the samskar of my practice, it's coming back to me more and more, and more and more I'm finding in my days how grateful I am for the simpler and simpler things. And one of the things I like about restorative yoga is it it reestablishes in us a human rhythmic connection with time. And it's not the time that we measure, it's the it's the time that we are and the time that we feel and the rhythm of us as human beings on the world, in the world, of the world, moving in a natural human rhythm. Not multitasking. You know, you can't multitask an asana. And I think <laughs> I think that's why some people feel so much better, or we all feel better after an asana practice. Because you can only do trick and asana. You can't do trick and asana and hip stand at the same time. And so when you're when you're doing restorative yoga or any asana, but one with the intention of this deep practice of intimacy that restorative yoga is. You're just there doing that. And that is a radical act in today's world. It's a radical act in today's world to say, I want less. I'm not going to the mall. I did this. I'm not, I didn't go to the mall for a year. And you know what happened? Nothing. Or I didn't, I love shoes. I'm a shoeaholic. And I just, decided not to buy any shoes for six months you know to go towards less to go towards simplicity to go towards stillness and I try to give something away every day and that's what you do when you get on the mat in restorative yoga you you give yourself the gift of presence and you get wonderful physiological benefits and actually, we have studied this, and when you are relaxed at the end of Shavasana, your anxiety levels are greatly down. It's, diff- it's impossible to be in parasympathetic dominance, deeply rest in a restful state. What I call the mm-hmm stage. If someone asks you a question, all you can manage is mm-hmm. You can't even talk, or even not even that. Maybe you can't even say that. When we're in that parasympathetic state, we are not anxious, which means we're not afraid. So I want to tell a little story from the Vedas, if I may, and then I'd like to take another question. Yes. And there was a guru. And the shishya, the disciple, went to see his guru. And the guru said, I'm directly connected to God. So the shishya, the disciple, went home and he thought about that. And it kind of bothered him. And he came back the next day and he said, Guruji, isn't it egotistical to say that you're directly connected to God? The guru's answer, it's egotistical to say you're not. (laughs) 
So when we are anxious and afraid and irritated and all of those things that we know are the obstacles Patanjali tells us and other great books tell us, we've forgotten our connection with the divine, with the whole. Whatever word you want, cosmos, universe, the the, the connection with the highest and best parts of ourselves, whatever you, you like. And part of what restorative yoga gives us is this ability to remember who we really are. And when we do that, fear goes out the window. Should we take another question? Beautiful. Yes, um, I have two related questions, so I'll just ask them at the same time. Uh, Jeanette is asking if you have any favorite pranayama technique you do in the beginning of a restorative yoga practice. And Jill is asking if there are some meditation or meditation themes that you use often in teaching restorative classes. Well, the pranayama I like best for most people is samavritti, which is equal inhale, exhale. And it can be done in some of the poses. So it would be long, slow inhale, long, slow exhale, normal breath in, normal breath out. Then sometimes I'll give at the end of a restorative class, I'll give a visamavritti, which is an uneven breath in which I elongate the exhalation because that is very calming to vata dosha and vata dosha has high anxiety it's the it's the dosha of the nervous system of activity and movement and quickness and creativity and it gets very stirred up in our and out of balance in our culture because our culture is all about chain and movement physical mental we, we don't focus, and I, I have found in the last 10 years, especially with the rise of the cell phone, the ubiquity of the cell phone, that people cannot lie down on the floor very easily and rest. They're, they're agitated, and they blame the pose, which is interesting how we do that as human beings. <laughs> I can't do Shavasana. It, irrit- it agitates me. Uh-uh. Shavasana is neutral. You bring the agitation to the party. But so I like Samavritti for general classes. I also like a, a Samavritti in which the exhalation is elongated um, because that's that's really manifesting a letting go. It's like petting the dog in the direction that makes its hair lie down instead of running your hand the opposite way. <laughs> and that's very soothing for the nervous system. And everyone, even if you're not a Vata Dosha or don't have very much of that energy in you, you live in a culture that... We eat Mexican food on Monday, Italian food on Wednesday. We forget to eat on uh, Wednesday, Friday. We just we go to bed at different times. We get in airplanes and go to different time zones. And we, we email people in Massachusetts and Uruguay and, you know, Ukraine and South Africa. I mean, this is a typical day for me. And we're thinking and we're moving all the time. And so there is, in an age of constant movement, Nothing is more important than being still. Physically still. And you know, that's rare. Even when you sleep, you're moving around. So that's what I like. And as far as a meditation, I'm wondering if the question isn't what do you what do you tell your students? to focus on in a restorative pose. So I'm going to answer that question, hoping it meets the needs of the questioner. Mm. And, and what I do, and I tell them this during their breathing, also afterwards, just while they're lying in Shavasana, because sometimes I do breathing as the beginning of Shavasana, and then we segue into Shavasana, is I tell them to focus on the sensations of breathing. We can all practice that right now, if it's safe for you to do that. Now, I'm not talking to you about the breath itself, because what will happen invariably if we focus on the breath, we'll start to change it. We'll want to breathe more, and that's our ego in action. 
But so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you feel any movement in your shoulder blades, a pressure change in your belly, a movement of the skin around the back side waist. Whatever you feel, stay present with the sensation of breathing. And that brings you away from thought and into the bodyfulness I'm talking about. The, the mindfulness of the body, the bodyfulness. Because sensation is nonverbal. Sensation has two wonderful qualities. It is nonverbal. And most meditation techniques have to do with watching your thoughts, paying attention to them, and this sort of thing. Uh, which is very useful as well, of course. But this is a different thing. It's the sensation. It is nonverbal, number one. And it always always is in the present moment. We know thoughts are in the past or the future all the time, rarely present, but sensation is always here. If you're sitting in a chair now, where's the weight? You know, just go down into your belly, stay with the sensation of the breath moving, and you're you're here. You cannot... Re, you, you can remember that yesterday you stubbed your toe and it hurt, but you can't recreate the pain of it. If you stub it the next day again, oh, yeah, now I remember. That feels familiar. And this is my joke about that is that's, is that's why women have more than one baby. <laughs> because they forget the sensation of labor. And hormones help you do that because invariably, for, if it's true for me and everyone I've ever talked to, you go into labor with the second one, you're like, oh, yeah. And then you forget again. And then I went into labor with the third one. Oh, yeah. Now I'm remembering. But you can't carry sensation the same way you can have thought. And so it's a wonderful meditative uh, focus. And one of the th things that I do when I'm out and about in the world and I want to remember my highest values and my, the sweet gratitude I felt five hours ago in my practice of just slipping away again, is I just go with my focus into the center of my brain. Right above the ears, go straight in, right at the, 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 you know, the sixth chakra, the third eye, and from the back of the skull, go in. And where those four lines intersect, it's right in the middle of the brain. And actually, it's the middle of the sphenoid bone where the pituitary sits in this little opening in the middle of the sphenoid bone called the celica terzica, which is the Turkish saddle. And it's the center of the brain. And if I go to the center of my brain, I'm present again. So I, I use sensation and I use that kind of focus with going away from the frontal brain to the back and down and more center part of the brain. And that I find, and many people tell me they find very, very useful. I think that ultimately the practice of yoga is about love. And that in the end of our life, what matters is how well we've loved ourselves and others. And if our practice is not bringing us to the state of loving ourselves and others, in a fierce, with a fierce compassion, not the love of cowards, but the love of lions, even those we don't like, that yoga is ultimately, t that's where we're going on this journey, is to dissolve into that. That's all. And, and my favorite quote, Judith quote, is this one. We think that life is strong and love is fragile. But really, it's the other way around. Life hangs by a thread, and love holds the universe together. And I'm so happy to be in that universe with all of you. Namaste. Good night, Judith. Thanks again. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us.